thank you very much. And welcome to this session on um, unlocking Britain's IP post-Brexit. We have um, excellent speakers today. And um, what, we, what we really want to talk about, apart from the, the title, is Philip Hammond said in, at a conference recently that the UK was going to lead the world's fourth industrial revolution from here. And so I think what we want to hear from our speakers is about how that is happening and how it is going to happen. The UK, I think, at the moment, is it has been a, an, an excellent position in terms of, of startups, in terms of moving ideas forward, in terms of the environment for bringing uh, excellent ideas into excellent companies. And the question we want to ask today is, what it, what extent, to what extent can that and will that continue? I'm hoping the answer will be that it can and it will, and things can only get better. Um, obviously, the, uh, the startup sector, the tech sector in particular, was very, very anti-Brexit. Uh, in fact, pretty much 100% against, right? And I think I have a panel who would have, would have preferred us to have a different result, but uh, no. But uh, we won't talk about that. <laughs> but uh, uh, looking forward with uh, great optimism to the opportunities. So, the panel from my left, we have uh, Simon Rogerson, who's CEO of Octopus, which um, launched back in 2000, right? Which yes. was a, a brilliant year financial startup, the year <laughs> that Money Week started. Um, and now have, what, six billion or so of assets under management, uh, very much focused on uh, the VCT sector. And this is something we, we may come on to, which is the phenomenally um, encouraging tax environment for individual investment into smaller companies, which is, is great in the UK. Um, then we have um, Peter Davies of uh, Lansdowne Partners, but also the um, OSI, Oxford, Oxford Science and Innovation. Now, this is a... a an, an organization that is exactly what the UK has been needing for, for ages. You know, one of the problems in the UK was long that we were excellent at having ideas and absolutely useless at then turning those ideas into excellent commercial organizations. And uh, so your organi organization is very focused on that. And uh, then, of course, Mike, Mike Lynch, who I think you will all know, and uh, your organization, again, does something very similar in Vote Capital, designed to take excellent ideas, particularly in uh, artificial intelligence, and move them forwards into top commercial organizations. Um, one of the ones that I was looking at earlier, the one that is planning to make all M&A lawyers redundant uh, by making their work done by robots, which I thought freedom was fascinating. Up to do more creativity. fascinating. And I thought it might be the, the final blow to the London property market. <laughs> the redundancy of all lawyers. And so I'm going to ask our panel to each say, uh, uh, give us five or six minutes on things that they find interesting in the market at the moment, interesting investments, and the um, barriers that they see ahead of them, and how they think we may overcome those barriers such as they are. So maybe, Simon, if we could start with you. Sure. Thank you, Marin. Um, so I'll talk about, um, I'll be wearing a venture capital hat today, so I'll talk about our experience of backing about 500 high growth small businesses since we set the business up 17 years ago. Um, I think the first thing to say, the environment today is very different to the environment of about 10 years ago. I think the UK outside of the US is probably the best place to build a business. And there are three reasons for that. Um, and three reasons we'll need to focus on to make sure we stay in that number one position. The first is ambition. Uh, the second is access to finance. And the third is access to talent. So if I start with ambition, and I talk about some of the graduates, so if I cast my mind back all the way to when I was a graduate, um, I left university in 1997, and I followed a pretty logical path, I thought. I could have gone into consulting, I could have gone into financial services, I could even have gone into accounting. Uh, I chose to go into financial services. That isn't the case anymore. So the smartest, the best graduates are looking to go join startups, or they're looking to join venture capital firms. And I say that we put a job uh, post out a couple of months ago for an associate and a ventures team. We had 1,000 applicants in the first 48 hours. It is mind-blowing. I think the second level of ambition is from the entrepreneurs themselves. So conversations 10 years ago with entrepreneurs were about building businesses that might be worth 100 million pounds. I think now those conversations have gone on to businesses that, businesses that might be worth um, uh, might be worth a billion pounds. And so these ambitions have become truly global. So we've even opened a US office uh, a couple of years ago, and that's to help the 60, 70% of our portfolio companies that already have a presence out there. The second aspect is access to finance. I think the UK gets this very right. So last year, there was about 6.8 billion pounds went into tech investment in the UK. That was more than twice the amount that came from any other European country. There have been lots of alternative sources of funding emerging, whether it's peer-to-peer, -peer, whether it's crowdfunding, whether it's some of the challenger banks. I think there'll be some he headaches and some speed bumps along the way, but it's a move in the right direction. 
The one challenge, I think, for um, UK funders is Octopus is in a fairly unique position. So we're able to fund from 250,000 all the way up to 25 million, but most UK, UK VCs are not able to do that, not, not, not able to grow with their companies, and that's a real shame. So now when we're looking at the growth uh, capital rounds, uh, about 60-70% of those are run and led by US venture capitalists. The final point I make about financing is to do with the AIM market. So it has been a spectacular success. The Nouveau Marché launched and failed. The Neuermarkt launched and failed. Uh, the AIM market has raised over £100 billion since it was set up 20 ago. It tends not to get uh, that much coverage. It should do. It's a fantastic way for companies to grow and scale. And the final point I make is uh, access to talent. So it really is a war for talent. The U UK needs to make sure its doors are open. About 35% of the uh, founders and the entrepreneurs we're backing are from uh, outside the UK. In some cases, they're tech teams. 70, 80, 90% of these people come from outside the UK. We need to make the UK a welcoming place for them and their families. Uh, it needs to happen. I'm sure the conversations are going on behind closed doors. Uh, it'll be part of the negotiation, but it's fundamental to us remaining ahead uh, in this market. So I conclude by saying I think over the last 20 years the UK has done a phenomenal amount to lay the groundwork. We're starting to see some of the rewards of that come through. We're typically on some cases second, third, fourth generation entrepreneurs. So in our case we back the original team behind Love Film. Those founders have gone to set up Zoopla, they've gone to set up Secret Escapes, uh, Greys, Tails, all of which have been successful in their own right. And if I had to pick two sectors where I think the UK will absolutely disrupt and where I'll be putting my personal money, I would be looking at the financial services sector and I'd look at the energy sector where the UK, I think, leads the way. Thank you. Can I ask one quick question before we move sure. on? Is it, you said that AIM has been phenomenally successful, which it has, and similar markets in other countries haven't worked. Why? What's the difference between the way we set up AIM and the way other companies have set up their smaller company markets? Uh, well, certainly recently, the government has done all the right things. So it's abolished stamp duty mm -hmm. associated with AIM stocks, and it's also allowed AIM stocks to be held in ISIS. And without getting into too much of the tax uh, benefits around this, there's a legislation the um, government put in place called business property relief. Business property relief means that assets fall outside your estate for inheritance tax purposes. Business property relief is afforded to most of the companies listed on the AIM market. So for retail investors, uh, that's, apps, uh, that's a key benefit. You can take existing ISAs, uh, you can take those existing ISAs, hold AIM shares, hold a portfolio of AIM shares, and that will fall outside your estate. So the government understands the benefits that's created there, the job creation, about half a million jobs are, are created by companies uh, represented on the AIM stock market, and other countries don't have similar tax okay, benefits. So pure tax incentive. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, Peter. Hi. Peter. Um, so, so just for those... Sorry, is that working? Yeah. Um, I mean, for, the, for those of you who... Many of all of you, I imagine, who haven't heard of OSI, um, OSI was set up in conjunction with Oxford University 18 or just under two years ago and has raised just over £600 million to invest in spin-outs from Oxford University. Uh, since we did that, we've actually invested in, I think, over 35 companies um, over the, all of which were brand new companies using Oxford intellectual property and, and working with the academics in tandem. I think that the lessons one's learnt from that are kind of threefold, three, three positive lessons. One is, and echo some of Simon's comments, one is the culture has already changed. You know, the idea that academics or universities don't recognise both the economic potential and, I would say, responsibility of what they're doing with taxpayer, ultimately with taxpayers' money is something that's completely different from how it was when we first got engaged in this 15 years ago. The second thing is the intellectual capital is astonishing. You know, Simon talked about the last 10 years of government tax policy. You know, Oxford has done 800 years of investing in academic uh, intellectual capital, and quite rightly, what you see in Oxford, and I'm sure it's, it's true of other universities in the UK as well, is, you know, an asset that is genuinely world-class that's thought of and treated very much as a financial liability in the UK, which, to my mind, is slightly crazy. Um, you know, wh when, I take, when we take some of these companies over to you know, global investors, we have investors from China, from America, as well as a lot of British investors, you know, without exception, all of them just get incredibly excited about the potential of what could be achieved. Um, the, the, sec the final thing is that actually, in this case, 600 million obviously is a lot of money, and to your point, was not easy to do, and, and I think we did an okay job actually of finding pools of capital. I don't think it was 
necessarily easy at the time to do that, but you know, was clearly a big differentiator for us. And I think behind that kind of lies a broader point, which is I think where we are today is kind of two related problems, or, or challenges anyway. One is you know, private capital is amply available for individual companies in the UK, partly due to some very enlightened policies by the government, partly due to the hard work of people like Simon. Uh, institutional capital in the UK is, is really struggling to get into very long-term investing. In part, I would argue, due to sort of some perfectly sensible things that have been done in terms of regulation and pension funds to try and make them stable, but the net consequence of which is it's almost impossible for big UK pools of institutional capital to take very long-term views. The corollary of that is that the UK has got, I would say, almost too much seed capital at the moment. It doesn't, what it lacks is development capital and development expertise. You know, and you know, at some level, you can see that historically has also been the case. Britain's traditionally found these brilliant inventions but failed to build the huge companies around them. And some of that, as Simon says, is ambition that's changed. But also, I think the reality is it becomes slightly self-fulfilling because the capital isn't available, the intellectual capital isn't available. You know, it's worth reflecting on the fact that pretty much the biggest drug in the world, Humira, was developed with MRC government funding and yet is building in a gigantic US uh, pharmaceutical business. You know, the best AI business in the world, DeepMind, which is found in Google's lead in the AI, came out of effectively a combination of UK entrepreneurs and universities. You know, this, this issue that Britain, I think, really does have, and hopefully what we're trying to address with OSI, is how does one translate the, see, the early companies and the ambition into real late-stage big companies. And I think within that, there's kind of three things that, you know, capital is one element of that, which hopefully we can solve. You know, our ambition is to take these companies not with just one, not for three or four years, but to put 50 to 100 million pounds into individual companies, hold them for 10, 15 years. But I think also what one finds is that the sort of soft issues around it in terms of how you find early contracts, you know, who you introduce them to, the mentoring that you can give, all the things that Britain should be quite good at in terms of its network, really giving them, giving out, and government can clearly help with, really giving companies access to that at an early stage can dramatically transform that and give them a scale of ambition to correlate with Simon's point. So all good news, lots of things to be done, and hopefully we're positioned a bit better than we were. I, I guess two other reflections I might make just on a broader point in terms of the topic today. One is, um, you know, the, what I think Britain has in spades is world-class assets that are treated as financial liabilities. You know, in many ways, uni universities was the second of these for us. When we first invested in football clubs in the UK 15 years ago, it was almost identical. You had an asset that everyone knew was a brilliant brand, but was treated as if it made no money. You can very readily, within the UK, see a ton of institutions that you know, have huge amounts of IP that could be unlocked with the right access to capital and so forth. Um, and secondly, and I think it's a much wider thing than perhaps the tech and university bias that naturally comes today and should be thought of as such. And secondly, when people think about the IP of the UK, you know, in terms of the heritage, in terms of the freedom of thought, and in terms of the creativity, when one thinks about infrastructure, again, I would strongly urge, whether it's governments or policymakers or whatever, to think about infrastructure for IP as being a much broader gamut of things. You know, the infrastructure that creates economic prosperity in the UK based on IP is a much wider gamut than people to typically give it instance for. So to give you an example, you know, my, my wife, I, I get to spend a lot of time in York, and you know, York Minster, as well as being you know, incredibly important for any number of reasons, effectively is the basis of that economy. You know? And yet, when people try and fund York Minster, they think of it as a purely philanthropic, and, you know, philanthropic gesture where, and struggle to raise the capital for it. You know, ensuring that that infrastructure is you know, maintained and optimised is an economic imperative for that region. And yet, when I listen to most people talk about infrastructure, they tend to have a very narrow definition of it, failing to reflect either that or the fact that the most important bit of infrastructure of the last decade has been the App Store by Apple. And you know, building a bridge is not building infrastructure for the modern economy. And I just don't think many people, when they think about policy and infrastructure, really have a sufficient view to, to form the basis of what people like us can then do, if the, given the IP is there. And you know, we, we're thrilled to be able to fund it. Excellent. So. Thank you. That's a very interesting view on, on, on what, what makes IP. Can I get, take you back to one question? Uh, I promise I won't ask everyone questions before we open it to the audience. But you were talking about there being this difference between seed capital and development capital. And do you not feel that that's a, a 
a trend that's beginning to turn. So, you know, there's your organization, Mike's organization, and then inside the retail market, you're beginning to get these funds like Woodfoot Patient yeah. Capital, like Trust Like Scottish Mortgage, and yeah. this kind of thing at Bailey Gifford, beginning to move into that space. Yeah. I mean, it's a fantastic, so it I mean, the weird thing is, it's a fantastic commercial opportunity. Yeah. You know, one of the things I've tried very hard, well, we've tried very hard to do with OSI, is say, look, the reason this is a good idea is because the investors in our company are going to make money doing this. Mm. You know, there is a massive seed capital and a deficit of development capital. Investors should be doing this, mm. um, and they are, and to your point, they are beginning to do it. And I think it will change. I mean, I think there is a different problem with the institutional investing market in the UK based on pension fund yeah. regulation, which just effectively means that by guaranteeing people's pension fund, mm. you limit the ability of people to make long-term investments. And yes. socially, that trade-off may or may not be worth making. But yeah, and it may be a trade-off that we change over the next decade, possibly. We, well, we'll if see. we don't change it, that's going to be you know, what we've got at the moment, namely you have to get to quite extreme potential outcomes to incentivize the investment yeah. will be where we persist, which yeah. we won't have a competitive advantage in it. Interesting, thank you. And Mike, we've heard an awful lot about, uh, about the good stuff, and uh, maybe, maybe you might address some of the, the challenges ahead. Yeah, I think the, um, you know, obviously my experience is having been an academic and then been involved in uh, a series of companies that have gone from startup to, to some of them very large. The important thing, to understand is everything we're talking about here is a high-class problem in the sense that uh, the one asset we have in the UK is the science base, which is you know, just as good as anywhere else in the world. And that is something which is, is almost possible to, impossible to recreate from scratch. So it's a bit like being some sort of country that has vast oil reserves and it hasn't managed to get them out of the ground. Now, that's changed. So when I started, you know, the idea of doing a startup was a non-starter. You couldn't actually um, give options to your staff. You couldn't list those companies. And uh, that pipeline from startup to world class um, is unblocked. You know, we've seen the arms of the world start up and then get to being world class and, and sold for 24 billion. So the question is, given that we've got this amazing asset and we know that it can be done, where are the narrow parts of the pipe that we need mm. to fix? And the startup scene is vibrant and wonderful. Culturally, the best and brightest want to do businesses. Universities have. Um, had to embrace and now do it enthusiastically, the idea of, of commercialising technology. We have great scale-up businesses. Um, it's really the last part of the pipe. So at one level of ambition, yes, AIM has been successful. At another level of ambition, the UK markets are not successful. We have one software company in the FTSE 100. And what's actually happening now is that our great businesses are being sold at about 150 million valuation, normally to uh, acquirers probably from the US. And then those big technologies are going on to create very large businesses. And in terms of the pact with the UK taxpayer who's funding the original R&D, it's very important that we see some of those things stay in the UK. So I'm not in any way saying you know, we should be controlling takeovers or anything like that, but we need to make it uh, rationally a good decision for investors to keep those businesses and grow them not to 150 million, uh, but to 5 billion or 10 billion. And the technology is good enough to do that. And so, you know, what I've been doing with Invoke is we raised a billion so that we can just keep funding them. There's no cut off. And also, in the UK, the one thing you don't have is the same hinterland of experience about marketing or customer support um, that you would have in the Valley. And so we, we're trying to create a a, a sort of central point to bring that in for our investors. So the great news about this is if we get a few of these to go from the 150 million to the 5 billion, the effect that has on all of the rest of the investment chain kind of looks after itself. As soon as you can have a 5 billion exit, then you've got mezzanine investment. That means you've got late stage VC, early stage VC. So um, we're, we're sort of at that last point now of really uh, opening up this uh, this pipeline. So, very enthusiastic. There's nowhere else in the world other than perhaps the US that has these areas. And in some areas, I would argue in artificial intelligence, for example, um, the UK uh, leads the world. So, what are the opportunities from here and what are the challenges? Well, the most important thing that gets forgotten is that all of this only happens because of the UK science base. So, it's very easy when someone presents an idea um, or turns up a small company to sort of get the idea that they sat in their bath and did it. Almost invariably for the deep tech ones, they've come from uh, 
some fundamental research, and they've been trained through that process. So protecting the UK science base, it is the oil asset that we have that we can then exploit. And one of the, the things we'll have to look at there in terms of European um, issues is that obviously that has all been operated under a European framework and it has been a very consortium-based model. And uh, we need to move very quickly to replace that uh, with whatever we decide is, is very important. Uh, we've already heard the importance of talent. Uh, you know, all this really needs is a little bit of political um, courage. This is not the same debate as the Polish plumber. The talent we're talking about here are people who are, often have unique and special skills. And remember, almost no startup in Silicon Valley has been started by someone from Silicon Valley. It's about being an attractive place to draw the very brightest in. And uh, you know, once you do that, then that can create this virtuous circle of training people and getting things. There are practical uh, issues that we need to think about. Um, whilst in our area, a lot of our value is intangible and our products ship around as electrons, um, you know, there are still areas, say so advanced manufacturing, where in a just-in-time world, if your component that you're shipping out or needing gets caught in customs for an indeterminate amount of time, it doesn't function. So th these are things that are practical that you can think about. On the other side of the equation, I think there are opportunities. Um, you know, a lot of the regulatory framework can now be looked at again. So for example, if you take something like modern medicine, which is now becoming very personalized, very targeted drugs, very data-driven, then the old regulatory frameworks, which were about very large cohorts, don't really apply. And the UK could create a very good environment for testing those sort of things, or autonomous vehicles, or looking at the insurance uh, around some of these new technologies, which will be enabling factors. So I think there are um, opportunities that we can take. And then if we look at how we get to have a FTSE 100 that has eight software businesses in it that are worth 10 billion each, then it's looking at ways of making the financial markets work for that. And again, we may have a degree of freedom uh, in doing that that moves forward. The only other area I think that is very obvious now that we've realized that this system works is the friction around IP transfer. So, um, you know, Pete's got a system where he's managed to, to take out um, some of that friction with particular institutions. But as you go to each university in the UK, the way in which it's done is different. Often it's not very entrepreneurial. So the university will decide that even though this thing may never work, they want to spend 70 or 80 grand on the IP arrangement, which means that the, the startup needs to spend a vast amount of money. You know, sometimes they have unrealistic uh, requirements. They want to own 40% royalties on a product. Well, it's never going to happen. Um, other times, you get a different model where we'll just take 1% of everything and let's plant a 1,000 seeds in which uh, you know, flowers bloom. Does the entrepreneur, does the professor, does the university own what? Uh, this is something that we could just, given that the taxpayer has funded all of this, sort out, and that would remove another layer of friction. The most important thing, though, just to say at the end of it is all of these opportunities are about saying we are leading at the moment. Outside the US, we are the leader. We should take this change as a time of opportunity to say the UK is the place to do research, and the UK is the place to turn that research into incredibly successful businesses. And if we do that, then we're incredibly well positioned for the economic impact of a lot of these new technologies. And the last line I leave you with is that I think the technologies that we're all talking about today are about to have an incredible effect on economic activity in the world. You leave us hanging. That's what I want to know more about. <laughs> We have, we've actually only got five or six minutes, so I, I think I would like to open it straight away to questions if anyone has them, which I'm sure you do. Um, if, if I uh, point to you, would you mind telling me uh, where you're from and who you particularly want to answer your question, given that we're quite short on time? Should we start here? Uh, yeah, my name's Jim Price. I'm from the Taxpayers Alliance. Um, you all mentioned taxpayers in general, but I was wondering if there's anything in the tax code... Oh, thank you. Sorry. Um, in the tax code or in the in the tax code, oh, thank you. Um, anything that you'd like to see in the tax code going forward that could perhaps encourage 
um, businesses to stay in, in British ownership or, or rather than being kind of bought up by big American firms that would help them grow? Things you'd like to see in the tax code, perhaps, please. Oh, I don't mind answering that one. So uh, there's 250 billion pounds in stocks and shares, ISAs, from retail investors. There's even more than that in cash ISAs, probably the worst investment you could ever make. Uh, and uh, the government should allow, as part of its patient capital review it's doing at the moment, it should allow, allow ISAs to invest into unquoted businesses. That would, not immediately, but over time, I think, make a big difference. And it would be a, the right kind of capital. Pete was making points Individual earlier on. Individual unquoted businesses as opposed to via one of your funds, you mean? Yes. Yes. Interesting. Um, any, any thoughts, Pete? Or Mike? Not really no. Well, I think there's two. First of all, uh, if you look at uh, R&D tax credits, at the moment, it's very loosely defined. You'd be amazed what you can get an R&D tax credit for. I think if you tighten that up, which would free up some money, and then you, um, you made the definition um, tighter, but you had a big headline figure, I think that could, again, drive this idea that the UK is completely about uh, innovation and the future. And I think you could make that change tax neutral. The, um, the radical one, if we say that the biggest lev lever in terms of the payback for the UK taxpayer from this area uh, is getting the 150 million to be a 5 billion because it employs people, it generates tax, you know, the shares get traded, I mean, would be to look at whether there's some um, extension of what's been so successful at the AIM level into companies as they get bigger. So it might be something where, for example, if you've gone into a company when it was smaller, you can run that model further, you know, even if it gets bigger into, um, in, into the market. So there's a, a, a real incentive to want to stay uh, with those businesses as they go from their 150 to 5 billion. Now, that's less likely to be upfront tax neutral, but remember how many people a $5 billion business employs versus one that someone sold for 150 million and those people are employed in California. So it requires a little bit of brave thinking, but there may well be some, some areas where that can happen. Thank you. Mike Friend over here. So, so I, I'm, I'm from Oxford. And I we're really concerned that people understand that about one in four of our academics are non-UK EU citizens. One in four are bringing about 20% of the entire research budget from Europe into the UK. And so our, our, our fantastic success in science, and obviously we've seen this investment which has been transformational, is based on what is essentially under the sea level. The iceberg is, 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 is very much European, and I think we've got advantages, but we've somehow got to bring that back to mainland Europe. It's 500 years since people came from the lowlands and actually from the low countries and created the sort of translations of the Bible, which created Oxford University Press, which has kept the thing going for 900 years. We're at a point where we've got to find out how we keep academics coming to the UK to keep us at the top of the game, because as you say, the academics aren't invented in Oxford. It's like Silicon Valley. They move to Oxford because of what we can offer. We need to figure out how we offer the IP developments, the way in which we invest in companies to our partners in Europe, and that has got to transcend coming out of the EU. So the question is, how, how do we do that? Any thoughts on how, how we well, keep these academics coming? Before you start with the actual answer, there's a massive perception problem. So today, um, you know, if you go and talk to Paul Nurse at the Crick, academics, uh, he's had academics that have signed to come that are now not coming. Okay. So what this requires is some signposting about the fact that we are still... Um, you know, open and welcoming. Um, that requires a little bit of political courage, but not much, frankly. Um, and that needs to be said. The argument you hear against that is that this would tip our hand in the negotiation. But actually, us drawing all the very brightest out of Europe is actually a problem for Europe, not a weakness for us. So I think we, again, it's one of these things where a little bit of bravery and a little bit of, of action now um, means that the thing settles down, we, we keep things stable, we don't lose the people, and then um, you know, we can actually look at how that works in future. So I couldn't agree more, but we need help as universities to become sort of multinational and have crick centres in Paris, in Berlin, in Rome. We've got to somehow get our institutions to be based not just in the UK, but, but multinational. Yeah, thank you. I think we've got time for maybe one or two more questions. One here. 
Uh, James Kidner from Improbable, a tech startup. We're three years old. We've got about 200 people, and they come from about 25 different countries, many of them from Europe. Um, we tend to forget, and picking up the theme from that last observation, we, we tend to forget that this is a two-way negotiation. Have you, any of you, seen evidence that the Europeans are going to, in a sense, wish to be difficult about what they will see as a brain drain into the, into the selfish and, and solitary UK from European institutions? Or is that something that we needn't worry about? Again, I think they, so I've had letters from, I think it's called France Digital already. They've kind of jumped on it. But, but I think it's all irrelevant. I think it's much more the perception. If those entrepreneurs or those academics think that we value them and that they will be welcome, I don't think you'll have the problem. Um, thank you. My name is Leslie Cate and I'm from Pagefield Communications. Um, I think that this issue around the idea of Britain being a selfish and solitary island is actually at the heart of a lot of this problem about academics and people within um, the kind of the startup and tech. You know, at the beginning, Marin, you said that it's kind of people voted to remain within the, the referendum predominantly. Um, I'm finding that that's not necessarily the case, but people are not that comfortable at kind of standing up and opposing that view because they've kind of been shot down or kind of called out for that in many ways. And I wonder if that kind of um, lies at the heart of what this issue is. Because when I speak to people abroad in Australia or across Europe, how they see it is that it's being promoted as a kind of a, you know, draw, pull the drawbridge up. But actually, today, when you hear David Davies, he's talking about an open Britain. So there seems to be a conflict between how certain sectors are seeing what is happening at the moment. I think that just comes back to uh, what Mike was talking about, a perception problem. You know, the yeah, the only thing I would Simon say is we employ lots of technology people across our portfolio companies. And, um, you know, overwhelmingly, they, they did not want to leave Europe. Now... Um, so I don't think I don't think that's a false concept. Um, but you know, the, the vote's been made. We're going. Um, I think the important thing is that there's an open debate. You know, there are practical problems that's going to throw up. Let's discuss them openly and find out how we mitigate them. And there are opportunities. So the people that are sad that we're going need to be open to the opportunities. And the people that um, uh, you know, we're very gung-ho about going, need to admit there are problems. And as long as there's an open debate, and that's why conferences like this are great, yeah. we can get the best out of it. Okay. Last word to you. Oh, gosh. I guess I'd reflect on one other, or two other points. In that, A, I think the understanding of why is it that people wanted to come to Britain in the first place, what is it about Britain that made it attractive, is a question that should be asked more than it is. Because actually, you know, Yes, as the heritage. Yes, as the general standard. But you know, the you know thing as I talked about earlier, the, infra the soft infrastructure of the UK is incredibly attractive for people on a global basis to work on. And I still think we take that a bit for granted and don't think enough about what we mean by soft infrastructure, whether it's you know what we can see out the window or things like that. And then I guess the other point I'd make, which is something definitely in Cambridge and Oxford, the same thing, is actually if I said what the biggest limit is likely to be in five years' time, it's going to be housing availability. You know, the cost of living. You know. This is where government kind of has a genuine responsibility, is that if there aren't more houses in Oxford, then people aren't going to be able to afford to be in Oxford, let alone, you know, the young academics won't be able to afford to be there. And, you know, London's fine because it can spread out, but Oxford just can't do that. And so the government role for creating the infrastructure in order to house that growth is kind of a key thing as well. Thank you. Well, that just proves that there is no conversation in the UK that cannot come back to house prices. <laughs> 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 thank, you. thank you very much to our panel.